I'm here to talk to you today um, about the Catholic curriculum. Um, with a title that I just kind of had to fire off um, because Matthew was chasing me because I'd missed deadlines and he said what do you want to call it? So I came up with Not for a Fire in Eli Fenn. It's a, it's a reference to a poem which we'll come back to later but which I think just distills the essence of what we're trying to do when we talk about a Catholic curriculum. Firstly, a little bit about me because I'm sure you've got questions. I'm sure you've got questions. And one of them is quite often, is it ginger or is it brown? <laughs> Ginger. Um, but just a little bit about me. I came to teaching quite late. I came in when I was 28, 29, something like that. Um, and I, I was up at St Andrews studying for, in the Divinity Department there on a French chap called Donald Lubach. Um, and I left that to get teaching. I tell you that not for any kind of status effort or anything like that, but just I have since got uh, like an almost allergic reaction to all overly academic language and all of the rest of it. So I will just be very straightforward and plain speaking today. Um, I joined a school via the Graduate Teacher Programme. I effectively just looked for all of the vacant RE jobs in Catholic schools and I sent them all an email. And I got two responses, one in Bamber Bridge and one in Carlisle. And so I ended up in the, in the Carlisle school. Um, it was a tricky school with tricky intake and all of the rest of it. But I, I don't know, I just felt that there was something we could do there. So I went and joined. And by 2012, I was um, head of RE, but teaching like all small Catholic schools, teaching all sorts. So psychology. Sociology, the citizenship, PE at times, me trying to teach year eight girls dance, can you imagine? <laughs> and I was bigger then than I am now, it wasn't good. Um, in 2016, I made a switch to primary, I'll explain that in a moment, and then um, be became a deputy in 2017, and then just in December gone, um, got made the executive head of the Secondary Federation. And so that's me. Now my secondary schooling, um, you might have seen it in the news, I don't know, some of you might have even sent us donations, you were very kind. It was Newman Catholic School that was pretty much destroyed by the floods in 1516. And I don't know if you can quite tell, but the brickwork is actually a little bit lighter up to there, and that's how um, high the water's got. Um, and, you know, it, the school was destroyed and it now looks a little bit more like this one. Like this. Um, obviously, there's not much teaching going on there. Um, but at this time, we were kind of bunked up in various different porter cabins and around various different schools. And I was approached by um, a local head and just said, Michael, you've been through a lot. Do you fancy doing something even harder? I said, Oh, come on, what are you talking about? He says, We've got a primary school in the central. What do you mean it's in trouble? Well, we're not percent for everything. We've had two required improvements. We've got an offset due. We've got no Catholic staff. And the roles have dropped from about 120 to about 80 in the space of 12 months. So obviously I said yes. <laughs> Mrs. Merrick. <laughs> Mrs. Merrick was fuming. But she did forgive me. And from there we took we took St. Cuthbert's um, Catholic School on a journey. We were off studied within, sorry, too much for my brain to comprehend, having to do two things at once. Um, we took um, the school on a journey, and managed to get to that um, important good, just to keep the, you know, the, the inspector off our backs. But more importantly, we managed to transform the RE as well. I put the curriculum bit with um, exclamation marks because I was fuming, to be honest. I thought we should have pushed for an outstanding and we have it. But it wasn't my decision. The point is, though, the Catholic life, we turned it into a, a real kind of powerhouse of evangelism. We wanted people to know what we were about, and we managed to get that switch around. Importantly, with no Catholic teaching staff. It was just me and my boss, who was an executive head at the time. So that's a little bit about my journey, but that's also the context for where I end up now telling these kind of stories. And I have to apologise right now. If you're looking for something deeply poignant and thoughtful and, and some sort of kind of moment, I'm probably not going to give you that. But what I can share with you is just some of the stuff that's gone through my head over the last few years, and some of it might have purchased for you, and it might shape your thinking as you're going along. And the first one is this beautiful building here. Where are we? That's not a question to you, by the way. This is like some sort of pub quiz. The question is, where are we as a group of people, as Catholic RE educators? And the first thought, or well, the first story I want to tell, is going to um, Carlisle Cathedral. That's the interior of Carlisle Cathedral. It's beautiful. One of ours, obviously. <laughs> but it's beautiful. And I was sat there because my eldest child was involved in an outreach concert, um, and they were singing, and they were singing beautiful songs as well as Phantom of the Opera. And as they were going along and singing, I was sat thinking to myself, why do we never do this? 
Why is it whenever my child or children want to have access to incredible forms of beauty and performance and, and just greatness, they always have to go to the Anglican Church to do it? Why are we not doing it? Where's our culture? And of course there's an answer to that which we'll come to. But that was the first question, I suppose, with which I started, which leads us to this. Now this is a beautiful church. This is um, Trinity Church um, in a little village called Wetherill. And as you can see, it's just a normal church. You can see the east window, you've got the south, water, the south uh, door. And here, probably in Congress really, is a huge mausoleum on the north side of the apse there. And the question is, why is that there? Well, the answer is, the village where this sits is right in the heartlands of a great um, old Catholic family called the Howards. And the Howards kind of, uh, well, we, we, there's a saint, saint Howard, isn't there? We, we all know the Howard name. However, they kind of went in two separate ways. In Cumbria, where I'm from, half of them decided to um, conform and became the Earls of Carlisle. Half of them decided to pay their dues, which meant that usually the husband went to um, service so that they'd get fined, whilst everybody else kept like Catholicism going in the background. Now, when emancipation happened, they built a beautiful church here, our Lady St. Wilfred's, built by A.W.M. Pugin himself, and so the inside of it is like a jewel box of the Neo Gothic. It's gorgeous. But it's that mausoleum that got me. Because you see, the point of the mausoleum was kind of summed up for me in this little transcript here. You can't, you probably can't see it, so I'll just read the important bit. It's about a young man, the son of a Howard, who wanted to serve his country but was not allowed because he was Catholic. So he had to go and serve the King of Sardinia and he died for them instead. Now what's really interesting is that line that he died in anxious hope that his country, which he loved to enthusiasm, would not long continue to reject his services. We bring with us, as a community, a story of being on the outside. And then with emancipation, a story of having a place defined for us. And I've just always wondered, does that kind of shape our psyche? Have we sometimes just been a little bit too accepting of mainstream, secularised norms and unwilling to ask different questions, unwilling to try a different way. And I would say, with curriculum in particular, that possibly this is true. Partly because it's easy, isn't it? It was just easy when we had actual curriculum. You didn't need to do any more work. But partly because of a reluctance and possibly a, a lack of courage, but not in a negative way, to strike out, possibly bring with it the approbation that could come. So that's my first section. Where are we? Well, for a long time, we've been kind of under the thumb. Now that's really important when we get to talking about curriculum. The reason it's important, because it's obviously what we put in the curriculum will be shaped, sorry, shaped by the psyche with which we approach that curriculum. And if we find ourselves being kind of on the back foot or willing to just be dictated to, then we get the kind of clashes that we're all going through now with new HRSE documents and all of the rest of it, but also wider things as well. I used to teach history. And the anti have you ever seen history textbooks? The anti catholic stuff in there is shocking. And I still use it because it saved me planning. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And so we find ourselves in that position, I think, where we need to say, well, is there an opportunity here? Is there something we can do? And curriculum is the way we can do it. Now let me tell you a story. I remember when I first started teaching, it was a bit awkward. Because you always get that first session where all the PGC students have gathered up, and you always get asked two questions. Number one, think of the teacher that inspired you. I always get asked that, don't I? And I, I wasn't too sure, so I made one. He was like first confession. <laughs> <laughs> like first confession, so I've like, oh, been looking kind to me, man. Um, <laughs> But the second question is, why do you want to do this? Now I just had, I had to sit there, I was one of the last in line, you're going around the room, I was thinking, how do I say that I just want everyone to become Catholic? <laughs> I'm not gonna say it. That's so why I just made something up, didn't I? I just said, oh, to inspire people's minds, or something like that, I can't remember. Um, but it's an important point, because actually I would bet that with our vision of vocation, our understanding of what it is to be a Catholic teacher given a Catholic education, 
we're already slightly different from a lot of our peers and colleagues. Of course, we share the same broader ambitions about enlivening and enlightening and offering opportunity and, and all of the rest of it. But we've got another perspective. And that's that in some way, our education, we want the children to be brought closer to, to our Lord and also to in some way kind of unfold the Lord's mystery, God's mystery to the children in front of us. And that puts us in a different category altogether already. We've got a different aim. But if we've got a slightly different aim, then our, our curriculum is going to have a slightly different flavour. Does that make sense? you with me so far? In fact, in this case, I'm not saying anything controversial until we get to this bit. <laughs> Look, too often, this is ignored because it's okay we've said Christ at the centre in our mission statement. How often do you see that this itself, which is absolutely and wholly true, is reduced to a form of words that does not shape practice? How often is it a cover to say, yeah, of course we're Catholic. You read our motto. <laughs> You've seen the statues in the hall. <laughs> but then it stops the hard work. And the hard work is, how does our curriculum bring people to Christ who has, it is at the center? How does it revolve around him as the beating heart of what we are about and what we are doing? It's harder than a mission statement. And sometimes that mission statement and these lovely little phrases that we shove into the eyes, you know, the internal implementation of, that we shove into there can hide it. So with that said, I think our curriculum has got to consider various things. And some of them are here, not all of them, but some things that I would say a Catholic curriculum would need to at least think about are these. Firstly, identity. <coughs> I'm not saying it has to be identitarian. I don't think we need to churn out children and adults who are raging against the world for hundreds of years of being kind of disenfranchised. That's not what this is about. But it is about knowing who we are and what we believe. And I think if we have children who live our education after 11 years and they can't answer that question, then I'd ask ourselves, have we really told them? And have we made sure they know? Because they should know. Because that's what link, sorry, that's what it, you know, it kind of forms what comes next, which is where I put memory. Now, I don't mean memory as in, you know, do retrieval quizzes and all the rest. I don't mean that. I mean preserving memory, almost like a contract between those who have gone before us to those who will come next, and we are a living link in that chain of the people of God, and it's our job to preserve it and pass it on. So when I say memory, I kind of mean it linked to the identity of who we are. Let's not forget, and let's preserve, and let's pass on. Now with that comes utility. Anybody who's ever seen me mouthing off on Twitter, as I do far too regularly, will probably be surprised that I think utility should have anything to do with education. And in the secular sense, you're absolutely right, I don't think it should. I'm quite an extremist on that, actually. But our education should have the utility have a utilitarian name in the sense of preparing or giving our children the tools to kind of labour in the vineyard. And that's probably where this, the Catholic social teaching element comes in from the curriculum. That we want to give our children the ability to serve God out there, to serve the common good. And finally, growth, <coughs> flourishing. So that children leave us richer than when they arrived. That seems fairly straightforward and I hope nothing too controversial. Now, what's really, oh, one really nice way to talk about this is this word, formation. We've got so many beautiful, kind of wonderful, kind of allegorical tales to, to exemplify this, but I always think of the potter and the clay, and our education is kind of really being summed up by that, that our ambition is higher than just pouring liquid in a vessel, the knowledge stuff. It's shaping a whole person. And we've got to remember how radical that is. And we've got to remember that when people who oppose us kind of get the heebie-jeebies about that, they're right to do so because we are that ambitious. We do care about the child's moral and spiritual development as well as their intellectual development. And we are trying to form somebody into the kind of good Catholic, the good servant of God that we would wish them to be. It means we just have to take it on the chin when somebody says, well, that's indoctrination. I mean, have you ever seen, have you seen the lapsation rates for our schools? Indoctrination. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> There's not a lot going on, is there? But we nonetheless need to maintain that we are here to form these children, and that's got to shape what we teach and how we teach it. Now, 
Chesterton. He's just so quotable, isn't he? I'm one of these people who quotes Chesterton all the time. Uh, sorry, Chesterton all the time. Partly to give the impression that I've read the things that I've quoted, and I quite often haven't. But it, he's just so quotable. And um, education is simply the soul of a society as it passes from one generation to, the, uh, to another. The reason I think that's really important is because what we are doing when we are educating our children is that we are giving them a lifeline. A lifeline to him, but also to the world around them. We are giving them a treasure in some sense. And that is not something that's preserved an aspect just for now. It's something that is inherited, that we have inherited, and something that we wish them to pass on. It is a line, a chain. And so in that sense, it is, an, it is the passing on of human life. And since we're involved in formation, it is the shaping of a soul. Now I find that so often, especially when I was teaching secondary, we were so timid about this. Maybe it was just me, maybe all the others were like properly hardcore. But me, I was so worried about this. Thinking, oh gosh, I mustn't stray into the personal. I must just keep it really very factual. Not go to, you know, that kind of uh, very old fashioned reserve. And as time's gone on, I've thought, but am I depriving these kids of something that they need to know? Am I depriving them of a challenge? Quite often, <coughs> I, in my view, children will reject the faith, but they're actually rejecting a parody of the faith that they don't know. And to be able to reject something, you've got to know it, because then you know what you're rejecting. It's really, I, there's, there's now, I remember going to, I remember my fourth year of teaching, um, and we just, um, we just had a football match, I was teaching here, we just had a football match, and I went to the dentist, and I sat down in the dentist chair, and I completely forgot, it was last Wednesday, I completely forgot. I lay down, and I just got a little snigger. I thought, I said, you've got wood on your head, you're in teaching PE. <laughs> but the point is, the point is, the important point is, that in that sense, that person, does that dentist did not recognise an almost universal symbol of our faith. What's going on? You don't even need to have gone to a Catholic school, really. But I'd feel even more uncomfortable at the thought that maybe some of our kids don't know, neither. And that's not good. Especially not if you've had them for 11 years. So, why is all that important? Well, the lack of confidence that we sometimes have, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> they'll tell them straight. And they'll be completely open that we're doing this to shape them and to get them to act in a certain way in society. And so I sit there and thinking, well, why shouldn't we? Our story's better. <laughs> We should go for it. And more to the point, here's a really important bit. Everybody else who doesn't go to a Catholic school thinks that we are. Yeah. They assume that we're doing this stuff. And they come to, you know, you always get the parents, oh, they're not Catholic and are they allowed to come in? And I've told them they'll have to pray three times a day. But, uh, and, well, do you know what? Why aren't you doing that if people expect that you should be doing it? And if you are, fair play to you. Carry on. Crack on. But nonetheless, don't feel like we have to water it down for the presumptions of people who don't know about education but already assume that that's what being Catholic is. In some way their ambitions for us are higher than ours are. <laughs> Maybe that's just my experience. So, humorous, lovely bunch. Um, so to just summarise that, um, I would say that the curriculum is a part of formation. And so that makes it really important that we have a really thoughtful discussion around what it is. Um, we, what we value, or sorry, what we choose to pass on, is what and who we are. Because the only way, um, the only understanding a child will have of us and our faith is what we pass on to them. And if we give them a watered down, you know, a kind of 2D black and white version of what this is, then they're obviously going to think, good enough for me, it doesn't offer anything. No beauty, no mystery, no challenge. That means we must be authentic. And finally, if we don't do it, somebody else will step into that space and then we lose them. Which brings us to the final bit. <laughs> do you know what? I was dead worried about this bit. <laughs> <laughs> so I was told, I was told there's a bishop in today. Is the bishop here? Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thing is, it's not even really relevant. I just really, I got this book. <laughs> <laughs> I got this book for a secret Santa, and it's just absolutely brilliant. And you can get a bottle of it. It's so good. 
And the thing is, so it's a book, and it's got like 12 different dances on it. And here we've got the Carpenter's Clog and the Temptation Tango. And, you, and it's got, you, you, what, what those things, the hologram things, and if you move the book to the side, like Jesus is giving it one of these dances. And so I know it's a little bit, it was, it was brilliant. And also, with my bottom set year 11s one year, I got them to learn, learn about Lazarus using the Lazarus Lurch. So I'm telling you. Get dancing with Jesus. Now, why is this important? Well, it's not really, except it does lead me to my um, next night go. Um, and that was my, um, it was my second eldest child um, this time, um, who was involved in a dance production in Carlisle. And all of the local schools were invited to do a dance. And us being a Catholic school, we always do a biblical themed dance. It's great fun. The kids are too young to think it's shy, not, but I mean, embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> And so I go along and it's absolutely brilliant. But my daughter, we were doing that, so no. And my daughter was on, and it was when they were in reception year one around about that time, and it was just the most beautiful thing. All these children, and they all knew their places, and they all knew the meaning of the story, and all of the actions had perfect symbols, and all the rest of it. And then my daughter comes on, and she's dancing along, and she's the dove, and she's bringing, and she's dancing along, and she comes, and she brings the other branch like this, and then I hear it. A uh, lady sat next to me, seemed very lovely. What's that then? <laughs> What's that then? My daughter was six and she knew what it was and she knew what it meant and that knowledge will shape her for the rest of her life. She already had more cultural capital at the age of six than that lady to my right who again was lovely than she has or probably will have. It's kind of important that it seems to me with our history anyway. Because it brings us to this idea, cultural literacy. I, like everybody else, jumped on the bandwagon um, and was very excited with kind of a move toward knowledge and a move toward cultural literacy and all that stuff. I still think it's fab, I really do. But there was a nagging doubt. And it was kind of first displayed when I went to see um, my colleague's school. And it's a colleague who's always been very kind to me and, you know, you know very generous and answers questions and all the rest of it. And I went to see her school, and one thing that they were doing in the school is that the children all stand there, and very uniformly they, they, they um, recite a poem. And the poem was Invictus. And I remember saying to her, that's going to be half mischievous. Do they know they are our father? And she said, oh, no, why? I said, well, if we're talking about cultural literacy, the our father has more purchase than the Invictus ever. It's been a bigger part of our culture and our understanding of who we are than Invictus, which, in my view, isn't that great a thing. Isn't that quite important? I said, no, we're not a religious school. And I thought, there we go, there's a problem with cultural history right there. That it can, oh, well, it is, in this context, it has boxed itself into the secular. But in our context, it does not work. Because if you try and apply a secular lens, so our history, then what you are doing is taking off a whole way of understanding who and what we are and all our achievements as a nation and all the rest of it, as well as ourselves as a worldwide community. We've already de declared ourselves to be, in some sense, purposely ignorant. So I emailed Mr. Hirsch and I asked him precisely this question. I said, dear Mr. Hirsch, one of my concerns, I, I mean, I, I gave a nice opening paragraph, you have to do that. I hope all is well, um, I said, one of my concerns with cultural literacy is why is it that all of these people who have adopted it are so, so scant on scripture? Why do they not think that's important? Because it seems to me so many of our achievements in art and law and language and literature and all of this stuff needs a decent, a halfway decent understanding of scripture. What's going on? And if I may ask the second question, if we don't, do we not actually risk peddling cultural illiteracy and calling it enlightenment? He got back in touch and he basically said, this was developed for the US. And in the US, we are a blank slate secular um, society and that was, you know, that's what fits for us. We think the scripture bit belongs in the home. And at that point I thought, cultural literacy doesn't work for us. Not unless we change it. And not unless we recognise that the very lens with which we can understand so many things that go on is given to us through an understanding, a faith-filled understanding, or certainly a scriptural understanding of the context that shaped it. Go to the National Gallery. You will 
double your experience and enlightenment if you have a working knowledge of scripture than if you don't. So we've got to make sure that we absolutely put that in this the year of the word central to our understanding of a curriculum. It's got to be there. Not just because we think that that scripture gives our children through the spirit a chance to come closer to our Lord, but even on the lower level of being, you know, being well educated around it, it's the keys to the door. They need it. Otherwise, we've locked them out. We've not shared it. I suppose what I'm saying there is that we kind of need a Catholic lens. We need a way of looking at things that is recognisably Catholic. Now, I remember thinking this when I was teaching um, a little bit of psychology, but certainly sociology, and then history as well. That we have these things that we're supposed to go with, you know, a Marxist perspective and a feminist perspective and all the rest of it. And I always did just wonder, well, what about the Catholic perspective? Because that's a thing too. I'm not saying it's homogenous. I'm not saying there is only one Catholic perspective. But do we even open the space for the thought that actually there could be something distinct that we've got to say too? And maybe we should say it. Because possibly by keeping it within ourselves, we're depriving people of knowledge that could do the job that we're after, forming them. Hence that really pixelated picture of a Catholic lens. Now, <coughs> this idea of the eyes of faith, I always find really interesting. And Marshall McLuhan, who pretty much invented media studies, once said, um, I would have just seen it if I hadn't believed it, which I thought was very, very clever. And of course, we all know that kind of Lewis quote about, I, I see Christ as I see the sun, you know, I see everything else, everything else by his light. And I just think, if we think about our faith and the living out of that faith in the context of a curriculum, some of the subjects, most of the subjects are not our in, then do we need to kind of put a lens in front of ourselves about how we're going to approach it and the knowledge we're going to include? Because if we don't, then all we've really done is jumped on the back of what other schools are doing who don't think that's important at all. And then we've let them set the rules of the game again. Then we're back to those first slides and us just taking our place in society and not looking at Sometimes they over romanticise things, and maybe I'm doing that. But I think this is really important because it makes us a yeast in society. It means that we are preserving, or we can preserve, things that society generally has cast away. Things that they don't see the importance for anymore, but do you know what? They might in future. And it's our heritage. It's our understanding of ourselves, and of each other, and of our relationship with God. And in some sense, it's Philistinism that we're battling here. People who can't see the value in the true, the good and the beautiful. Not criticising them as individuals, but it gives us a job. And if we do that, and if we preserve that, then we become, <coughs> hence the picture, the modern day monks in the scriptorium, busily preserving the jewels of culture that others have decided to cast aside. Because if we don't do it, then it's gone. We likely won't get it back. Hence this quote from the Ballad of the White Horse. <coughs> And um, Alfred is speaking to Guthrum, who doesn't know it's Alfred. But Guthrum's having a bit of a confidence crisis. And Alfred, in the guise of a master, says, Therefore, your end is on you, on you and your kings, not for a fire in Eli Fen, Eli Fen. Not because you're gods or nine or ten, but because it's only Christian, God even, heathen things. We can find the good the true and the beautiful within and without our faith. And if we can preserve that for future generations, then we're serving society by getting our curriculum right. That got a bit deep, didn't it? <laughs> I haven't just spoiled the moment. So, just to quickly go over that then. Cultural literacy needs us. We offer something that others can't. And when we do it, if we do it well, then we will be seen as people who add yeast to society. We serve society by doing it, and we give this gift meaning. Brings us to choosing one. This is the hard bit. This is the bit that generates the controversy and you know, people getting fettled about. 
How am I doing for time, by the way? Uh, Okay. Um, this here, um, have you seen this artifact before? Yeah, who yeah. you suggest? I'm not going to put you on the spot, don't worry. I'm not gonna, unless you want to be on the spot, I don't know what you're saying. Uh, the Albert something, isn't it? Um, Alfred. 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 Yeah, it's a pointer, isn't it? Yeah, essentially. So, yeah, so there was a time when Alfred uh, was looking at his kingdom and he was kind of in despair. Not in despair, he loved his kingdom, but he was, he was kind of in despair at the state of learning in the kingdom. And he said there used to be such wisdom and such kind of virtue in this kingdom. And because of the state of learning, it's all gone wrong. What we need to do is get people to know stuff again. <coughs> and these are the things that I think they need to know. And so I'm going to write them, we're going to get them translated, and we're going to send them out. And as we send them out, to show how important it was, you're going to get this little pointer. And this is the top end of it, this little pendant, and it's absolutely stunning. But basically, it's like a little placeholder as you're going along reading to keep... Keep up where, you, where you're going. And I've always thought it's just a really, it kind of indirectly, it shows how important it was seen in the past that we treasure knowledge. We're not knowledge in the round. We're not talking like knowledge as blink here. This isn't pub quiz stuff. This isn't about curricular kitsch. It's about specific things that are important for all to know. Important for all to know. In other words, we've got to be discerning. When we choose our curriculum, there needs to be some real thought about what that in the whole offers to the children who sit in front of us. Because if we don't, what we'll end up doing is just fetishising knowing stuff. But without any coherent framework or meaning or reason to know it. Now, sometimes knowing stuff for its own sake is good, right? It's how I win trivial pursuit with my kids. <laughs> but at the same time, if we think that this curriculum's got a role in formation, then we've got to think that what finds its way onto there has to, in some way, serve that purpose of formation. And so we come inevitably to the Catholic canon. Now, this does seem to raise temperatures. I think people just kind of get a bit worried and think, Autonomy, I want to be able to choose. And I totally get it. I was the same. I do totally get it. But I do find it mad that we're a community. Sorry, that Catholics might find the notion of a canon difficult when we've got a Bible that's a canon of important texts. <coughs> that very process gives us a model of discernment and of choosing what needs to be known and passing on. The Catholic canon gives us that opportunity. Now, the reason it raises temperatures is because we all disagree on what should be in it, right? <laughs> and that's totally understandable. <coughs> but is it not legitimate to say there are some things we just want all Catholic children to know? Like, seriously, would anybody in this room be happy if um, Catholic children, uh, sorry, uh, ch children left out of schools and didn't know um, where Christ was crucified? Does that sing our praises, really? Are there some things that we could say, in addition to all other things, this we definitely want our Catholic, no, sorry, our children in our Catholic schools to know? Because that is the core heart of what a Catholic education looks like. And it might not take up 100% of the timetable, but nonetheless, they will have accessed this. And it might be true in all different subjects. For me, for example, I would want them to have a pretty clear idea of what happens after Christ died. I think that's really important. I couldn't tell you how many of our kids do. And we can do that in art, we can do it in music, we can do it in history. We can at least think about a core basis, which we could look at as an entitlement for people to be able to access, to know who they are, why we're here, and what we should do. I've got cotton mask, what's that? And for me, that's what the Catholic canon should be. And it requires boldness. It requires to be discerning. It requires, you know, to take the risk, really, that outside people will come along and say, oh my God, hey, that is that indoctrination thing again. Can't believe you're, I just, oh, I just lost in front of the bishop. <laughs> <laughs> it's that um, indoctrination thing again. And we've just got to be kind of bold and say, well, no, it's just that we think there's something to be treasured here. And this is what we want our children to know. And we're not stopping them from knowing other things. And we will give them access to that too, but they will know at least this. And when we get that right, we can really recognise the important truth of our curriculum and the simplicity 
that what we teach our kids is our redemption song. This is what brings them to Christ. Alongside, obviously, the, you know, the whole picture of things, but in terms of what we can offer to children, this brings them to Christ. In some sense, this knowledge is redemptive. If these children, by what we are able to do with them in schools, find themselves in a stronger, closer relationship with our Lord, or even given the opportunity to do so, to walk in the Spirit, then in some sense we have offered that hand to allow them to get where we are wanted to. That's why a is important. It's not about tests. I mean, it is. We want to pass tests, don't we? But it's not just about tests. It's because ultimately in the big picture of things, when we deny them that opportunity, we deny them more than just knowing stuff for a secular society. We deny them a bigger opportunity. Now, I'm going quick. Five minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, the problem for that is, what, what's the problem for that? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go really quick on this. So if, if some of this just seems a little bit blunt or a little bit, you know, kind of boldly stated, I do apologise. Um, but we'll, go, we'll see where we're in. The island state we're in. It, at the moment, it seems like there is a bit of a flourishing recognition of these kind of things. It feels like there's an appetite in the room for us to have these conversations, for us to put together an actual curriculum, and for us to work together to identify what that should look like. I'm quite excited by it, actually. I think we could find ourselves in a place where we've got some really good stuff out there. The problem is, everything, it's like a cottage industry at the minute. There's so many people in so many different places doing so many wonderful things, and it's just not sustainable for creating something that certainly has the scale to make sure that we achieve our ambitions. What we tend to find is that instead we're a little bit like this. We're all working along, working our socks off, let's be honest. It's not as if the job's not hard enough without trying to rewrite a whole Catholic curriculum, ready for people to you know, come close to our lot. However, it is hard. And so what I would say, the reason it's hard to an, to an RE teacher's conference is it's because we focus too much on RE. <laughs> I've got to explain, by the way, because I know some of you are thinking. That picture is not at all related. I literally googled RE core subject, and that came up. And then I thought... <laughs> and then I thought, Friday period 5, year 8, that wasn't it. So I'm putting it in. Um, but we, we, we're focusing too much on RE, because here's the thing. The amount of times I've been to conferences or training, and I've said, oh, here's some wonderful heart that you could put into your RE, RE lessons. Oh, here's some wonderful music. Have you ever thought about having some lovely tranquil music as they're walking into the lesson? Oh, and here's some history, church history, you want to shove it and don't get out. Just do a bunch of on it. Throw that in there as well. And oh, oh, here's some craft. You can do some Jesus craft. Do some Jesus craft. And I'm sat thinking, why? What's everybody else doing? Why isn't our music teacher doing that? Why isn't our art teacher doing that? Why isn't our history teacher doing that? Why have I got to do it all? That's not fair. And then obviously I bit my dummy off and just carried on with the day. However, there's an important point. And the point is that when we make RE so prominent, what we're really doing or what we're risk, at risk of doing is stripping it out of everywhere else. You just throw all the faith stuff into RE and say, go on, get on with it. I'm going to hold you responsible for mass attendance. <laughs> Whereas actually what we need to do is say, no. This is a collective effort. We're a Catholic school. This is a Catholic curriculum. And this should be everywhere. And then we increase our capacity massively. But also, we stop our e being oh, the God subject. Because actually, it should permeate everything. And there's no reason why it shouldn't. There really isn't. Now, um, when I first came to our current school, it was, um, it was knocked down in the late 60s. And a, a new kind of... Um, School was built in the, in the 1970s in a state about a mile from the church, and it looks like a 1970s school. It's not the prettiest thing, but nonetheless, the school has a long and venerable history. Um, and we've got our 50th anniversary coming up soon, 1871. And so I was going through our archives, and I found a logbook. It was the 1871 logbook, and um, it went on for the, these two logbooks, and they kind of run on simultaneously. Um, and this one ran on to 1891, and it has the standards in the words of the curriculum in there. And it just, I just found it absolutely fascinating because they got this back then. They understood that actually, what we are as Catholics is not just for the, as they call it, religious instruction or moral instruction. It was actually everything that they studied. And the history timeline sang that story. They taught the history of the church in history. They didn't just want me to do a module in year eight. <laughs> do you know what I mean? 
And I thought, actually, there's a great example there. That it should be through everything. Uh, so, sorry, through, through you know, the entire DNA of the school, really. Um, and I get that sometimes, you know, as RE teachers, that might not be something we control. Can control. I do get that. But I would say go to SLT. If you're not SLT already, you will be one day, let's be honest. There's not that many, there's not that many Catholic teachers about this. So you're going to be an SLT. But if you're not there yet, when you get there, be polite but stubborn. <laughs> go to your SLT, be polite but stubborn and make this case that you shouldn't be having to do all this and it's legitimate for other people to be involved in singing our song as well. The main problems, 30 seconds, I've got 30 seconds, I'll whiz through. The main problems, well the main problems at the moment, we don't have the, let's be honest, we don't have the number of Catholics in our schools teaching and leading as we used to have. The religious are not there anymore and in some sense it's been really, really difficult to recruit. I'm 37 and I've been in, in primary school for two years and I'm now an executive head. It shouldn't be happening. It shouldn't be happening. It, the reason it's happening is because we don't have enough Catholics. And we don't have the scale of people to be able to take on this project. We don't have the expertise anymore in our schools. We do have some, yes, of course we do. But we don't have it in scale. We don't have the capacity to, be able to share that round. And quite often, we don't have the resource to be able to fund it. You've got to fight with a trip to you know, the lakes or something, and, and it, it, it can be very, very difficult. So, if I may, and I hope this is not too bold, um, my lord, Mr. Barber, Mr. Robinson, <laughs> I do just hope that we get to a point where us schools who are trying our best can be reassured that the CES, that the dioceses, that the universities are getting together and helping us out on this. They've got the people. They've got, I hope, the vision. And they might even have the capacity. And with that, maybe they can provide something for us all, or at least just a start for it, so then we can take that forward and create something, a Catholic curriculum, that befits what we really owe, our duty bound to offer all of the children in our schools.